Thank you so much, Jana, for the nice introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be here, um, you know, and um, thank you for, uh, yeah, for coming. So uh, I'm gonna make uh, remarks today about um, the problem of data auctions and data markets. This is the collaborative work that I've done with my students, Anish Agarwal and uh, Marianne Rui and my postdoc, Thibor uh, Burrell. Uh, and as Jana mentioned, um, I think, at least Marianne is attending. If not others, I can see them. Um, so if you have questions and you wanna send them through the chat, we'll be happy to sort of be responding in real time. Okay. So to begin just a little bit with an introduction to the topic, I think data has become exceedingly important. I mean, obviously, you know, we hear about machine learning and AI everywhere. Uh, these uh, types of uh, uh, technologies are extremely data hungry. Um, and um, data has become an incredibly important uh, commodity, um, you know, um, not just in terms of uh, kind of slow processing uh, systems, but also extremely fast processing systems. I mean, we can just imagine that in the future, you know, we will be demanding data in real time and looking for information. You can just think of an autonomous vehicle uh, confronted with a with a with a thing that can, it cannot recognize, and it needs to learn more about it, and somehow looking for data to try to do some uh, image detection of some sort. So the problems are becoming extremely interesting, and data, even though it's abundant, it's not always available at the right place at the right time. I like the quote by the uh, European Commissioner that says, "Personal data is the new oil of the internet and the new currency of the digital world." There's no question that data has become a very important commodity. But until today, um, the trading and exchange of data has been extremely inefficient. Uh, if you think about data companies like Bloomberg, Nielsen, um, um, uh, and so forth, you know, they sell data primarily based on competition. They, they price the data because other people may be using this data. Now, part of what they sell is operational data. Bloomberg supports the stock market. And so a lot of the data is just operational for the traders to know what's going on in real time. But a lot of times we're looking for data to do more than that. You know, we are interested in prediction. We're interested in understanding uh, logistics, you know, supply chain, you know, interested in, in, in a lot of different um, uh, kind of inference type problems. So how do we then buy data um, it's often the case that you have companies that are just going out there purchasing an enormous amount of data, but then coming back and saying, well, this data wasn't really that useful. You know, we didn't benefit from it that much. We paid a lot of money, but we didn't benefit that much. So this trade of data is uh, somewhat inefficient um, and it's not truly a market, even though you have a, a very important commodity. Um, two other examples that are really interesting. So the Equifax, this is the, uh, the, uh, the rating company, when they had the breach of data, there was 150 million data sets, financial data sets that was released, became public. And one thing that's interesting about this is that possibly my data and your data has uh, also been breached and it's out there, but we don't really know exactly how to quantify the loss that came with that. You know, when there's a crash in the stock market, we have a sense of the financial loss that we incur. But when there is something like this data breach, um, it's not clear to us how to quantify that, that loss, right? And so there's no way of putting a, a monetary value on it. Um, a similar example with the Cambridge Analytica. You know, the, we know that Cambridge Analytica attempted to change the outcome of the election, say, in the United States. To what extent they were successful, that's a different story, but the attempt was there. So how do you actually understand the, fin the economic impact of the utilization of this personal data, every person's data out there? So, so there's a lot of different areas we're interested in data, and uh, it could be from a marketing perspective, it could be from fraud detection. We have at MIT uh, sort of an important project here that we uh, are working on in digital, uh, digital agriculture, where we're trying to empower poor farmers with their data. You know, and so the, asking the question, how can data actually become an economic relief for a lot of the farmers? And um, why should farmers or other people who are doing services of different kinds agree to share their good data 
given the fact that they compete with each other in different markets. So the question is, again, you know, what is the incentive to be out there giving your data for corporations or, you know, for, for uh, service provider or for farmers in this particular case, when you know that you're going to be in competition and then there is this negative externality. Okay. Um, so why is data a different um, type of a commodity? What's the difficulty in, in creating a market for data like a housing market or a stock market and so forth? Um, there are several things. One is um, uh, data can be replicated at a zero marginal cost. It doesn't cost you anything to sell your data to multiple people. Okay, and so you can do that, which you cannot do for, with your own house. Um, the importance of a data to a particular um, inference task is combinatorial. For a particular inference task, and I'll come back back to that point later, there may be different combination of data sets that is out there in the market that will give you the best possible prediction. So this puts us in a combinatorial type market which is complicated in terms of computational issues. Different buyers of data can come in for different types of inference and different uh, types of questions. I may come in because I'm interested in medical issues. Some other corporation may come in to buy data because they want to predict, predict logistics. We're all very different in the reasons why we use the same data sets, right? So that makes the problem a little bit more complicated. Um, a lot of times you can't even tell if the data has been useful until you use the data. And so a lot of times the validation of the importance of the data and the authenticity of the data happens after the fact and cannot be determined a priori. Um, and finally, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are externalities. You know, two hedge funds that are buying data sets, if they buy the same data sets, they will have a negative externality, a negative effect because the other company bought data to improve their, their investment. So it's not just what I get, but also what other people get can complicate the problem. And this externality question is really the main topic of, of our auction strategy on the market strategy today. Of course, I mean, there are different types of market out there, and I'm not going to bore you with a discussion generally of markets, but of course, you know, the stock market is one that we recognize where, you know, there's a, there's a market maker that uh, clears the market between the supply of stocks and people who are buying them. It's so sort of a very kind of a standard market design over here. We have a very interesting market, which is the ad auction market. Again, this is not exactly a digital good, it's a digital market per se, but when you sell an ad on a website, um, you cannot sell it more than once, so it's different than selling data. But then there is a data market underlying the ad auction market. That is when you open up a browser, uh, say the New York Times browser, um, there is a piece of real estate on that browser that all the vendors are competing to put something out for you to market. Okay, and in order to figure out what to put in, they go through an auction to buy this piece of, to kind of lease this piece of real estate. The auction mechanism that goes in there relies a lot on your personal data. And so there are these data companies in the background that are selling your information in order for these vendors to, to bid on, on your, on this particular real estate. So certainly we have, what I, you know, what a hundred billion, if not more right now, $100 billion market that is essentially a digital market, but of a different type, okay? And so the, the background market of where your data is being exchanged without actually you being a player is where our work and our concentration is focusing. And finally, I wanna say also, we have something like a prediction market. It's also a data market because what you're, in a prediction market, what you do, you certainly, um, um, you know, you're, you're uh, betting on a success of say a presidential election. So you place a probability distribution on one candidate versus the other. And in, in some sense, you win some money if your candidate wins. So we're not looking at the raw data per se, but we're looking essentially at you selling your prediction. prediction. So it is a digital market of sorts. Okay. So just to frame the general picture, um, the, you know, the kind of the data market that we're looking for essentially has three components, a data, a data intermediary, which is really the market that is sitting between a seller and a buyer. Seller has some data, a bunch of sellers, they all have data sets that potentially they may sell for a profit. 
uh, for money and buyers who are interested to come into the market and they want to buy data for a particular task they're interested in. Okay, and that's important. They're coming to the market for a particular task, okay? So there's a lot of work that's been ongoing and it's becoming a very active area of research where, you know, different aspect of this problem is being looked at, you know? So I would say one aspect which is really important is the whole complete closed loop of this data because one way to think about this is that I sell my data to the market that then in effect sells it to a company that is producing a product that comes back and is sold to me. So there's a feedback endogenous process over here where my data affects me at the end of the day versus certain markets where you know, the data is, is not affecting me directly. So I sell my, you know, maybe my um, uh, genomic data you know, and it helps uh, cluster different types of people with different types of behavior, with a different type of uh, medical conditions and what have you. It may, of course, this come back and hit me with insurance, so that could also fit into that model. So there's work done at this part over here. Uh, there's, of course, um, work done to understand the sellers and understanding externality among the sellers. Because one thing that is interesting about the data sellers is that they are not all independent of each other. For example, I always think about it is that if I sell my data, then automatically my wife's data become irrelevant because a lot of it is highly correlated with my data. And so I've already actually disclosed a lot of information about her just by selling my own data. So that's part of the seller's externality. And then, and, and that's work also done in, in, in the literature now. And the last piece is where buyer's externality is important. So when I am interested in buying something, but my competitor is also coming to buy a similar type of data set or different type of data set, but they're getting better prediction as well. So because they're doing well, I am actually negatively uh, affected. So I'm gonna focus on this part of the story today, although the whole story is, is a very interesting and active area of research, okay? So in thinking about the market, just to focus the issue, we have a seller, we have a buyer, and we have a market, okay? Um, importantly here is for our formulation, sellers are not invested in the outcome of the sales, they just wanna make money. So the sellers are money makers, okay? The buyer is interested in some accuracy task, but they want to predict something. I'll give you an example in a second from a logistics company. What is the market doing? The market is going to allocate data to this buyer based on a bid, and it's going to have them pay a price for it, okay? So it's gonna determine a pricing mechanism and an allocation mechanism, okay? So that the buyers can get some of the data to improve their um, prediction. In principle, we think of the market actually doing that computation for them. So the market is gonna provide them with that prediction at a certain price. So this is where I'm gonna go into an analysis in detail. What are the pricing mechanism and what are the allocation mechanisms that are important for making this data auction work? Okay, so let's start just by getting an understanding of the buyer side of the story and what, I, what do I mean by um, uh, coming for some accuracy or coming for some valuation. So let's think of a, a company or a bunch of companies that are logistics company, companies, right? So these companies are trying to estimate the demand of a certain product. You know, it could be retailers, for example, are trying to estimate how much they should stock of, uh, uh, of denim for the back to school season or the Christmas season. Right, And we all recognize from operations research what's known as the bullwhip effect. And that is if you make errors in the prediction of what the consumer wants, okay, that propagates over cascades of the different processes and ends up being a very high uncertainty in the production. In order to actually satisfy an error to the consumer, you have to actually stock up by a lot more. So it's pretty costly. So companies for sure may be interested in going out there and saying, how can I buy accuracy on, on my customers? Prediction, accuracy in the prediction of what my customer wants. A good question, right? 
So, um, and they may specify how they do this computation to the market. This is a detail, but essentially in principle, as a buyer, I can come into the market. I say, I wanna, I wanna you know, predict the, the num you know, how much denim I need to stock you know, in the back to school season. And I usually compute that um, using this particular machine learning algorithm. And here's my history of data that I have of what I stocked and how it worked. The interesting thing here is that, that the, and the link of why pricing makes sense at the end of the day is that the data buyer has a valuation on the accuracy. So when, when the data buyer will tell the market if it wants, it can say, or it knows, let's say the data market knows that every 10% improvement in their accuracy maybe saved, saves them $1,000. Okay, so if the market can provide them with a certain amount of accuracy, then they know how much they save from it. And as a result, they have this particular mapping between accuracy to value. This is important, okay, because that at this point, now we have a way of valuing the importance of a data set to the buyer through this accuracy measure, okay? Also potentially, uh, we can think about these logistics company, companies in competition, maybe they're producing denim and the one that actually has a better stock can actually do better. And if you as a co competition do well as well, you negatively impact me. So as a competition, I always would like to be ahead of you, but if you're also buying data and do, doing better at the prediction, then you actually negatively impact me. So there's always that externality, which I wanna talk about a little bit more. The buyers could be these independent sellers who don't care even about the business that you're doing. It could be the traffic in malls, it could be the traffic at Starbucks, it could be Uber uh, travels to malls and shopping areas, um, could it be GDP, it could be the, the unemployment. You know, it could be a whole bunch of data sets sitting out there in the market that potentially could contrib contribute to this particular prediction task. The message from the slide is to say that the buyer has a valuation. That's an important piece. Like when you go to buy a house, you have a valuation of that particular house. The buyer has a valuation for the accuracy that the market can provide. So our first sort of idea in terms of abstracting the problem is to move away from the data and just focus directly on the accuracy. So take that part out of the market for the time being. Because as I said, every level of accuracy could correspond to a combinatorial um, a, a combinatorial collection of data sets, we will just look at the accuracy itself, okay? So the point of our first modeling abstraction is to say, instead of allocating the data, train a model and get a certain level of accuracy, let's just say that we will sell the accuracy directly, okay? And, the, and, and then at some point we reflect it back to the data and the wires, okay? as an abstraction, but it's a powerful abstraction. And then we know that the buyer has a personal um, uh, valuation, which is a linear function. So VI times XI, where VI is a private valuation, they know for a certain level of accuracy, they gain VI times XI, okay? That's our model, okay? So now what we've done is reduce the problem, the combinatorial problem of allocating data to a problem of allocating a single digital good to every possible buyer, okay? I have no budget constraints on this digital good because I can produce it as many times as I want to, okay? Because it's a digital good, it's like I'm selling a data set, right? So that's sort of the setting now that we are in. How do we, how do we allocate these, sing, these digital goods to the buyers? Okay, so we're gonna take a model of the utility and I'm gonna tell you some of the properties of the solution and this is basically how the auction works, okay? So I wanna say that um, if, you, if you have a vector of allocation, so I have N buyers and if let's say that the market allocates X sub I accuracy to buyer I, okay? Then I'm gonna say that the valuation to the Ith buyer is given by this linear model. The first piece of the model, VIXI, is value from their own allocation. That is, if you allocate them XI, this is how much they gain. The second term is the negative externality 
from others. So if you allocate other bias xj, then they're affected by it by eta j to i. This is a, just a, sim, a, a notation that says this is how the j buyer affects the i buyer. Okay, so there's a linear negative externality term. That's our model. Okay, so the valuation that I get from the allocation X depends also on other people's allocation. It's not just a function of my allocation, it's a function of everybody else's allocation, okay? So that's the picture that we think about it is that the data market is allocating X, so the design of the mechanism that I'm interested in is that the market is gonna design the allocation and the payment function. So how much each buyer is gonna pay for that particular allocation and the model is representing both the value to these, to these buyers, to these firms, and the competition part, which is the externality. The externality, we think of it as something that comes from the fact that these guys are, are buyers in the same space. And so they compete in a, down, down, <clears throat> in a downstream market. Because they compete in a downstream market, there would be a negative externality. So why the linear model? Well, because first of all, because it, we like to analyze linear systems because linear in general allows us to do a lot more than more complicated systems. But it's not totally unreasonable to think that, you know, many markets locally behave in a linear way. So I'm going to give you a quick example without a lot of the details. Okay. And the quick example is a Cornell competition model. Okay. So just give you a motivation right now. I'm providing a motivation for why the linear model. Okay, so I take a corner competition. I have two firms, okay, and they're both producing a substitute good. So denim, they both produce denim, okay? And the question they're trying to figure out in a corner competition is how much each one of them is going to produce. So they're producing QI. Interestingly enough, in this model, model that I'm talking about is that there is certain inefficiency in the way they produce. So if a company said, I'm gonna produce QI, they'll end up producing alpha IQI, where alpha is some number between zero and one. And really in improving their production, they'd like to improve the quantity alpha I, okay? So that's the place where they're gonna purchase some data to improve the quantity alpha I. Now, the analysis of this model, I'm not gonna go through. This is typical Cornell model. The way you decide the QI depends on the equilibrium strategy where neither one of them devi deviate. We'll assume a linear model for the price and you get the equilibrium strategy. I'm gonna jump through all of that because that's, um, uh, what is it, economics 101, okay? Sorry. So the point is, I, I know what the equilibrium uh, pro, uh, utility function is, and I also through that, I know the equilibrium values of QI star that are being generated. So I asked the question that I asked before, what if each one of these firms paid to buy a data and buy some expertise, let's call it prediction, to improve their efficiency, okay? So they wanna improve their efficiency alpha i by an amount xi. Okay, so increase your efficiency by an amount X sub I and see what utility that gives you in order to figure out how much you're willing to pay for a certain amount of X I. That's kind of how we think of this market. I'm gonna buy data to improve my, my efficiency by a certain amount. So if you actually write down the improved efficiency by adding X I, so look at the difference in the profit or the utilities of these firms, you get exactly what this linear model that I was talking about in the first order. That is, if you look at it, you see that you benefit from the allocation of X1, you as a firm, the first firm, you benefit from increasing your efficiency by X1 through a product, some, some valuation V1, but also you suffer because of the improved efficiency of the competitive firm by minus eta. And so this model is precisely the model that uh, I mentioned earlier that gives me uh, my utility times xi minus the externality multiplying the accuracy of other people. So that's the motivation of the model. This is not to say that there are competitive models that are not linear. 
and cannot be linearized. There are, and we are also working on some of these problems, but this is a very interesting class of problems. And the solutions sort of bring up some interesting intuition for how these auctions work, sort of like the intuition of second price auction enabled a lot of methodologies to be, to be sort of designed around it. This is sort of the kind of intuition one can get from, from this linear model. Okay. Okay, so moving on, um, now that I motivated the model, it's a linear model of uh, valuation. And what the market is trying to do is to say, look, okay, you know, I wanna allocate, I'm gonna allocate, so the point is we're gonna be an auction, which means that the, the buyers, the firms are going to come to this market and they're going to bid for the accuracy. So there's gonna be some bidding and in, in economics, uh, you know, there's a, a notion called the revelation principle that says it's, it's sufficient to think of bids in terms of the private valuations. That is, what they bid, they bid their private valuation. They may not tell us that the truthful private valuation, but they will bid private valuation. So in that sense, in our model, there would be bidding some vector V1 and, and the rest of the eta IJ. Okay, they may not bid the, their, their actual values. This is something that is very important for the market. So we're gonna come back to that point. So T is the bid, not time, T is the bid. And based on the bid, the market is gonna allocate accuracy is also gonna charge a certain amount of money. The market could be interested in doing maximum social welfare. This is typical economics. Either we maximize social welfare or we maximize revenue. It's not always that we get the efficient solution where one coincides with the other. I'm gonna tell you both because they move in parallel. What's the maximum social welfare and what's the maximum revenue solution? The important thing about us is that here, the market cannot just go ahead and maximize the allocation because it doesn't know the private valuation of each, of each firm. It doesn't know the VIs and the eight Is. If it knew the BIs and the eta Is, then it can right away write an expression for this and maximize the allocation, okay? So the first thing the market has to do is to elicit this information, okay? But the, if the market asks the, the buyers, give me your uh, private valuations, the, the buyers are not incentivized to just give them the private valuations. They're gonna try to cheat because they're gonna try to game it. Maybe if I give, a higher valuation, I'll get more. If I give a lower valuation, maybe I'll get more. So the buyer is not incentivized to just give their private valuation. This is the important thing about the pricing mechanism. Can the pricing mechanism incentivize the buyer to bid their actual private valuation? So this way the market gets it without ever asking for it. And this is a notion called incentive compatibility. So the market is gonna to try to design this pricing mechanism to elicit the private valuation. Once it has the private valuation, then it's going to design the mechanism, okay? It designs the mechanism based on that, but kind of conceptually that's the case, okay? This is a really important point in this auction design, okay? Um, there are, so, so again, the market is gonna design, elicit this information, then maximize the allocation. It either can maximize the welfare or maximize the, 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 the total revenue, uh, expected revenue, sorry. Uh, this information that, that the, the way the market designs the auction also depends on what the buyers actually know. And so it's not just that the buyers, oh, so the buyers can know different information structure. And so I'm gonna give you two types of information structures where the auctions actually are gonna turn out to be slightly different. So bear with me a little bit on the concept and then we'll come back and, and talk about the details of that, okay? Again, the allocation is a digital good between zero and one. So actually to get a good intuition about this, let's spend, spend the next five minutes reviewing what does it mean when I don't have any externality, what does all of this translate to when I don't have externalities, okay? So that means that each firm values um, the, the allocation that they get, but they don't care about what other firms get. The eta IGs are all equal to zero. Well, because I don't have any budget constraints of what I allocate, this problem becomes an independent buyers 
each one of them is being allocated an accuracy of xi. Okay, so trivial problem, one firm, you know, allocate at some level of xi. So the allocation is x of the, uh, of the bid say, or the valuation, right? So if I knew the valuation, I'll allocate x of the valuation and I'm trying to maximize the utility, which is v times the valuation, or I'm trying to maximize revenue, which is expected value of the, of the price. So how do I solve this problem? Okay, so this is a basic uh, result, you know, from Myerson's that says, look, okay, if you're interested in, in truthfulness, okay, so what is that, you know, so we call, we say a certain mechanism, which is an allocation mechanism plus a pri pricing uh, um, mechanism. We say that's truthful if the bidder is incentivized to bid their actual valuation. This means that the bidder gets the most in their utility by bidding their valuation than bidding something else, than lying about it and saying, you know, I think this is not that important to me. I mean, you know, it's half of, of what I think it is, you know? If, if you don't bid your valuation, your utility is not maximized based on that quantity. So this incentive compatibility, okay, is true if and only if two things happen. This is a very powerful theorem. X of V, the allocation, the allocation mechanism is monotone in V, and second is the payment looks like the, the utility that X, the, that the, the, the buyer gets minus, so it, it looks like the actual incremental utility over all bids below their actual bid. So instead of actually passing this theorem, you look at this picture over here. If you bid V, what you pay is actually the area on top of this curve. So this is X of V. Okay, and what you're doing is you're paying the area on top of this curve. Okay, so it's really V times XV minus the integral under this curve. Okay, if the payment function has this property, which is in a way kind of a second price or incremental, incremental value for increasing your bid by a certain amount, if you pay this amount, then, then, then it's guaranteed, regardless of the allocation mechanism, as long as it is monotone, you are guaranteed to elicit the actual valuation of the buyer. This is a very powerful result. Now, if you so all you have to do is design a monotone um, uh, allocation function and then design the payment function this way, this way you will actually get the, um, the you will elicit the actual information that you're looking for. So the solution to the problem of social welfare is really, really trivial in this case, because you're trying to maximize V times XV. Okay, well, that's all you care about. So you can do this pointwise. Every time V is positive, get, make XV equals to one. You know, if V is equal to zero, you don't really care. So the final solution is in the social welfare, the trivial problem for the single buyer, give everything to everybody. Everybody that comes in, give them full accuracy and don't charge anything. You maximize social welfare, but you don't maximize revenue. So how do you maximize revenue, right? So, um, well, let's write the revenue. The revenue is the expected value over the distribution of buyers because buyers are coming in, presumably this is a game. So buyers are coming multiple times according to a probabilistic model, okay? So, so the expected value of the payment function, well, we can write it down and I'm not gonna go through the manipulation. It turns out to be the allocation XV times a quantity over here. That is a function of the actual valuation, okay? We call this the virtual valuation. F is the distribution of buyers, is the distribution of V. Capital F is the cumulative and F is the density, right? Assuming this is monotone, and under some conditions, this quantity is monotone. I'm not gonna go why that is an interesting assumption. So assume V of V is monotone, then I come back to the same type of a strategy I had for the social welfare. But instead of focusing on V, I focus on phi of V, a transform, a virtual valuation. This is standard uh, auction design. This is not new stuff. Right? And what happens is that now, basically, I will give full allocation for any time phi of V is positive, 
and I will give zero allocation when phi of B is negative. I can optimize this pointwise. So if the bit comes in and it's larger than phi of B, um, sorry, if the bit, if phi, sorry, if the bit comes in and phi of B is positive, then you get all of the prediction and if phi of B is negative, is less than or equal to zero, strictly less than zero, you get nothing. So all or nothing allocation. If you write this back, so this is one, this is the notation, the allocation function is a threshold. And if you rewrite it, it says that the valuation has to exceed phi inverse of zero. Okay, that's some sort of a reservation price. So if, you're, if your bid is larger than the reservation price, you actually get the full accuracy and you pay. If you look at that Myerson's payment function, it reduces to just paying the reservation price times XB. It's a linear function, so you get fee inverse times XB. But the XB allocation is one, so you, get, you pay fee inverse of, fee of zero. Okay, so the payment function is just pay the reservation price. If you're a bit higher, you get everything, bit lower, you don't pay anything and you don't get anything. Simple problem is solved completely. It's solved in the in the um, uh, social welfare and solved, solved in the case of uh, maximum revenue. The one thing I want you to, to notice from this, other than the fact that the solution is all or nothing, is also the relation between social welfare and revenue maximization is captured in this virtual revenue. Everything else looks the same, you just change the virtual revenue. This is gonna come back to us in the case of externality, surprisingly similar to the case of single buyers, okay? Uh, a point of interest, an interesting point here is that if you, for example, assume that the, the, the valuations are uniformly distributed, then here is something interesting that happens to the um, virtual valuation. If the valuation was B, so that's always a positive quantity, is a linear quantity, then the virtual valuation is actually can be negative at some time and positive in other times. Okay, so the phi of V, even if your V is positive all the time, phi of V can be negative. And so what is happening is that in the case where your valuation is small, less than 0.5, all your phi of V is negative and you are allocated nothing. Until V exceeds 0.5 and then you start getting allocated everything and you pay the price 0.5. So notice that in the maximum revenue situation, you are giving the data a lot less or less than you do give it for social welfare. So when you maximize revenue, you allocate less to buyers than you allocate when you're doing social welfare. It's an interesting sort of observation coming out of this particular model, okay? Um, so back to the um, kind of the question of um, uh, uh, externality. Okay, so now back to the externality. Again, the utility of each buyer is captured by their valuation minus PI, but now I said that the valuation depends on not only your valuation, but also the externality. So I'm gonna put back the picture in place. There are two information structures that one would care about in this setting, okay? There are situations where the buyers actually know their private information is the knowledge of the incoming um, impact. That is, I know how other firms impact my utility. Over the years, I understand that my competitor, whenever they do a little bit better this way, it impacts my sales in a certain way, it impacts my, my valuation in a particular way. There are situations where your, your um, private information is outgoing externality. That is how, so how firm one say impacts others. It knows the impact on others, but it doesn't really have as a private information what the, the impact on them. The general case would be some firms would know one thing, other firms would know another thing, okay? I'm gonna analyze the two cases, okay? And, 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 there, and, and the point I'm gonna make here is that the market needs to know what case it's operating under and it sets up the mechanism according to that particular case, okay? So let's just get a warm up for a second, because I want to connect this to the case of single buyer, okay, when I didn't have any externality. Let's assume for a second, let's assume for a second that the market actually has the valuations, okay? Well, then if it's trying to maximize social, and, and now we have externality, it's trying to maximize social welfare, so social welfare is just the sum of all the valuations, 
The sum of all the valuations, Bixi minus eta ijxj summation, you sum that, reorder the summation, and what you see is you're summing over i, Vi minus sum over j. So now what you're looking for here, this term over here is, is the, your own value, the i valuation minus how that valuation impacts others, how that uh, buyer impacts other times xi. So the trick is, in order to maximize social welfare, assuming that I have obtained this information from the buyers, the private information of the buyers, I also have a threshold policy. But in this case of the social welfare, you know, simply enough, all it says is that your valuation, remember in no externality was greater than zero, with externality it says your valuation should exceed the negative effect you have on others. Okay, the sum of the negative effects you have on others. So if your valuation, what you earn, is more than what you inflict on others of negativity, we actually allocate the full product to you. You get the full accuracy. And if your valuation is less than what you inflict on others, you get zero. So that's when the market knows uh, what these values are. So the, the game is now rather simple. Can the market elicit that information through the minuses payment function? So there's a summary of where we are. So in the case of the first scenario where, where buyers know the information about how others affect them, okay, so that's the knowledge, then here is the final result. It says that the market can actually give an allocation and design a pricing mechanism to, to attain the following result, right? So in the case of welfare maximization, you get the product if VI is greater than this particular quantity over here, okay, the, ne the, the externality, you, you, the negative uh, uh, impact you exert on others, and the revenue maximization, you get it if the transform, if the virtual quantities satisfy that condition. So the virtual VI is greater than the virtual impact you have on other. So it's the same story, not that different, but everything is transformed by fee. But now the threshold is not zero. The threshold is the externality that you have on others or the virtual externality you have on others. Something interesting comes out, and, and here's an interesting case where virtual externality, you know, virtual externality get more negative they're negative initially and phi of minus, you know, get more negative. And because they get more negative, that has an implication in terms of um, um, the more, the higher the externality that you inflict on others, the less of a chance you would be allocated the product, right? Because the virtual things is actually got more negative. So that's another intuition, but I'll show you um, uh, an analysis at the end. Well, okay, so, so what's the pricing mechanism that comes with this particular approach? So it does have to be an interesting pricing mechanism. So what do I actually pay? What is the payment that the buyer has to pay in order to be allocated the data when they are allocated the data? And it turns out that the payment splits into two pieces, okay? So they pay um, the minimum, the threshold, which is the minimum bid they have to not their actual bid, but the minimum bid they would have to put in to, to actually be allocated the product B. But in addition, they pay for the minimum amounts that they contributed to prevent someone from getting the data, okay? So collectively, somebody else, let's say X sub J, may not have got the accuracy, the data that they asked because they inflicted negative externality on others how much each one of these guys would have had to contribute to that, would have had to contribute to that to prevent XJ from getting the data, that's an amount you have to pay for as well, okay? So it kind of like two pieces, one has to do with your valuation and the other one has to do with how you contributed for someone else not getting the data. Where they didn't get, if they didn't get the data, you owe a certain amount for that, okay? There's always a little bit of a constant that can be added over here that I will come back to in, in a few minutes. Let's just ignore that for a second. Okay, just moving on. Um, 
Um, the story is not that different for the second type of externality, where the externality is outgoing, except that when the externality is outgoing, when I impact, I know my valuation is about how others are impacted by me, because it does, that information doesn't affect my utility, it doesn't, there is no way that the market can figure out a pricing mechanism to elicit that information. So the market sets up a, a pricing mechanism entirely based on the expectation of those values. So ignores all of this, whatever people report as uh, private information on the externality and just simply uses expected value for that, just because it doesn't appear in their utility function. So that again, the result is very similar and you will, you will get allocation if your valuation exceeds the expected amount that you will inflict on others. And in the revenue maximization, you get the same with things transformed by the, the virtual uh, valuation. Because of revenue, things get transformed by the virtual valuation. The pricing mechanism is also very interesting in this case because it shows that in this case, what happens is that you are going to pay the minimum bid Okay, the amount, the minimum amount you bid to get the result. So this amount over here times, of course, the evaluation that that will be one. Okay, minus. So you're gonna you're gonna pay the minimum bid, the, the minimum you had to bid to get the product. But then you are actually subtracting from that how others negatively impact you. Okay, so the negative externality kind of subtracts from this particular form. Now, these are forms that could be manipulated to look like each other in, the, in both the, these markets, but this is sort of intuitive in that, you know, your actual payment function is, is updated, you know, it's kind of reduced by this amount of negative externality, and then there's always this constant that can be designed. Okay, so kind of recap, if you lost me in the middle, we've we've got basically essentially a complete solution to the problem of negative externality with linear models, okay? And the, the uh, allocation function is still a threshold function and it's a threshold between your valuation exceeding the negative impact you have on others and in the revenue maximization, the virtual values exceeding the virtual values, okay? And virtual value is a transformation based on the probability distribution of the The payment functions are interesting in that the payment function reflect sort of this particular structure. They have a very simple interpretation, namely the interaction between your minimum bid to win the data and how much effect you've had on the outside uh, people. Now, one thing that is interesting that I haven't talked about um, is a notion called individual rationality. Individual rationality means that you know, should I even participate in this market? Am I better off staying away from this market? The problem is in, in this particular model is that, you know, there's always a negative effect on me even if I don't participate in the market because if I don't buy the data set and other competitors buy the data set, then I get a negative valuation, okay? So there's always a question of me participating to improve that a little bit. So I should participate and I should always get a positive revenue from the, uh, from the uh, interact, uh, get a better revenue, not a positive, but better than not participating. It's called an individual rationality. But it turns out that actually there's so much money collected in this market that the market not only incentivize me to participate, but the market can also charge me a fee to participate in the market and still I am individually rational. That is, that is, the market can increase. It asks every buyer to pay a prior payment, a fee to participate in this market, and they still they are incentivized to participate. And it turns out actually that this fee, without getting into too much detail into, into the definition, this fee over here increases as the externality increases. So as the effect of externality as a sum, so let's say E sub I, for i buyer, the sum of the externality of the i buyer, as that increases, the, the, the uh, um, participation or entry fee actually can be higher and the market can collect more money, okay? Collect more money, obviously, and ultimately will be given to the sellers. But that's an interesting sort of point of view is that this doesn't happen in a market without externality, but with this particular market, 
um, you can charge a certain amount and you can increase that amount depending on you know, the external valuation of the data, the external uh, externality uh, caused by the allocation of the data set. And finally, one example I would say is that in general, if you look at the revenue maximization versus another thing that comes out of the model, and this is what I described in terms of this virtual valuation, the revenue maximization allocates less than the um, uh, welfare maximization. So in the welfare maximization, you're not always allocating the data. You allocate the data when the valuation exceeds the negative externality that they inflict on other people. Uh, in the revenue maximization, you do that with the transformed uh, virtual uh, virtual uh, valuation. So this plot shows, for example, when the data is is allocated um, as a function of the um, private uh, value valuation, personal valuation B one. Th this is two firms, and then the effect of two on one, uh, one on two. Sorry, the the, um, infl the the externality inflict on others, right? And you see, for example, that the red line over here, all of this area is allocated well for welfare, while in fact the blue in this triangle over here is what you allocate for revenue maximization. So revenue maximization allocates in a smaller set of parameter space than in the space where, where um, um, uh, welfare, welfare maximization allocates you end up allocating the product a lot less time if you're trying to maximize revenue. Um, but if you're not trying to maximize revenue, you give it to everybody. And that's an interesting property that comes from, so we expect it, of course, an expectation. This is all true. And it's an interesting property that comes also from this all or nothing and the reservation price um, that, that you pay uh, for, the, for the product. So, let me just conclude, I know I'm running out of time here. Um, so there's a lot of different abstractions that would give a lot of intuition to the problem of designing options for data. The first one we did is to convert the data problem into selling one digital good. This is not to forget that there will be a problem to think about how do we go from this digital good to the individual data sets. That's, that's an important area of research. Um, I've given you a solution to the uh, both Max welfare as well, max revenue for the problem of linear externalities after I motivated that. So full information, different information structures. And we are looking at a lot of different things. Of course, you know, we want to go beyond linear, but it's not just having nonlinear, it's also having things where the dependency has a jump or a kind of discrete aspect to it. So the externality, uh, externality doesn't behave nicely as a function, uh, sorry, the utility doesn't behave nicely in terms of the allocation. So that's an area. Um, uh, other aspects of the data market is the seller's part. And then, as it, so the part is, if you recall, the pieces of it is uh, uh, focusing on the data seller and externality there. I haven't addressed that question, but how can you bring that to the, to the problem we're looking at? And then what if the, the data buyers who are actually competing in a downstream market are also feeding back to the seller. So the seller is invested in the outcome of the buyer over here. You know, so the seller is not a free uh, revenue maximizer, but rather somebody who also would like to see an outcome happen with the particular, with the buyer. So how do you put that back into the problem? So those are all open problems and um, uh, yeah, for the future. So I'll end here. Thank you very much for your attention.